In today's webinar, from the IP department to the boardroom, we're going to look at how IP intelligence and data analysis can support commercially focused decision making. I'm Richard Lucas, uh, and I will be chairing this meeting. I work for a company called Streamline IP, and we help IP departments work more efficiently and effectively with the management of their IP. Uh, one of the areas that we help our clients with is elevating the uh, profile of IP in an organization. And one of the ways we do this is to provide exceptional business insights to the board, uh, whether it's understanding competitors, strategy, the landscape, that they're entering into a new field, technical field, uh, or new licensing opportunities. We are very grateful to have two extremely experienced in-house counsel. Uh, the first is Alex Tame, and the second is Robin Safai. Uh, Alex is uh, head of licensing and IP management for an Oxford-based company called Oxbotica. He has 17 years experience in IP, nine years with Vodafone, uh, starting out in competitor intelligence, and then rose to managing the group IPR function. Uh, he was managing director for IP strategy and valuation specialist, uh, Collar IP, uh, for almost three years. So he's been, he's got a lot of relevant experience and he's been with Oxbotica for just approaching a year. Uh, Oxbotica is one of the world's leading automotive uh, vehicle driving software companies. Uh, it's the first, if this is the first time that you've heard of them, it's because you were, uh, they were only formed in 2014 as a spin out from Oxford University. Since then, they've come to meteoric rise uh, uh, in size and now have almost 200 employees. So we are delighted to welcome Alex Tame. Robin, uh, Robin Safai is a highly qualified IP attorney currently working in-house with a multinational company called Eaton. Uh, Robin is qualified French and European patent attorney and uh, has undertaken his US patent exams. Uh, he has over 19 years experience in IP, 10 in private practice for three well-known IP firms. And uh, he represented LG for two and a half years. Um, he spent seven years uh, on, focused on licensing before joining Eaton. Uh, his international experience, experience in uh, France, Austria, Hong Kong, and Korea, and he's been at, uh, with Eaton for almost three years. So for those who don't know Eaton, uh, it's a multinational power company uh, that manage with over 100,000 employees. Um, Specialisation is quite broad uh, with a range of electrical and industrial sectors, so aerospace, hydraulics, uh, filtration, vehicle, e-mobility. So we're very delighted to welcome Robin Sapai. Finally, on our panel, we're joined uh, by William Mansfield uh, from LexisNexis. LexisNexis have been kind enough to uh, organize this webinar. If you haven't had the chance to check out the patent analytics tool uh, patent site uh, for analyzing patent landscapes, uh, please do so. Uh, their insight into the uh, huge patent uh, information landscape million patents is uh, greatly simplified by some of the neat tools uh, that they have and a very simple user interface. Both our speakers uh, have used LexisNexis uh, patent site tools uh, for analyzing the patent landscape. Um, yeah, so just to expand a little bit on the, the background to my world in IP that Rich has just shared with you. I've um, spent a lot of time with Vodafone and seen the IP function through the lens of the CTO office, I guess. We used to work through the R&D office. Uh, I'm not actually an attorney. I'm somebody that's an engineer at heart and I've been involved in the world of IP very much from that perspective over the last sort of 15 years or so now. And, and so having moved into the world of sort of more consulting, helping lots of different companies, all shapes and sizes, on finding IP strategies and and the value of IP, I've got to know quite a lot about different types of companies and how they think about IP and fundamentally how that discussion around IP starts to be shaped at the boardroom to start getting a bit more traction. And um, if we go to the first slide, Richard, I think one of the things that I've learned through my, my many years in this industry is that the world is changing and over the last sort of 10 years or so, we've seen a new way of thinking around IP in that it's not really solely just about patents and trademarks, but it's it's more about intangible assets in organizations. And it's those intangible assets that are driving the value of companies. If we go to the next slide, 
for those of you who who are interested in this topic in more detail that there was a, a report issued by the UK uh, Patent Office a few years ago now which kind of brought this whole piece together and looked at the, the value of companies from an intangible point of view saying that today 80% maybe more of the value of companies is given to its intangible um, assets that it has in its portfolio and the report goes on to say that those companies that are able to really understand their intangible assets are deemed to be more successful and are seen to be more successful versus the peers in their technical sort of area in their landscape. Companies like us, I'm now with Oxpotica, as Richard said, we're developing software for autonomous vehicles. Our, our business is all about intangible assets and probably our numbers near a 90 percent and so on and so forth. And so what I've come to learn onto the next slide, Richard, is that every company has a range of this sort of hidden value, intangible assets wrapped up in the business. And it's really important to try and look at your own organization and understand which types of intangible assets are driving your value. And this slide and the next one, I've been um, borrowed from my, my previous employer at Collar to, to share with you. But I think it helps sort of extract some of the key areas that we consider to be intangible assets in business and what starts to drive value. And, and it's this sort of language that I found over the years gets more traction when you speak to senior stakeholders, speak to the, the board members or even to potential investors particularly helping a lot of companies with their IP strategy for investment over the years. This sort of language, people find it a bit easier to understand and engage with the IP world. And it keeps the discussion at a level which talks more about the value. My experience has told me that probably most companies have two or three areas that are driving their value. And it's, and it's often not just about the patents. Um, just a quick anecdote, we, we did a, a piece of research audit for a company in the food industry several years ago. And they came to us and said, look, could you, could you help us with our strategy, but particularly the value of the intangible IP that they've got? And we went away and looked at the business. We ran an audit, did some value work on them. And they said, look, we, we think our, our, our valuable assets in the business are our secret recipes that they, they, they define into their food. And we said, well, it, it sort of is, but actually the real components that are driving your value is your contracts and did you know that you've got one specific contract that is with a, with a UK supermarket that was underpinning 50% of their annual revenues and we said that piece of paper is more valuable than probably your secret recipes and that's a huge risk as well because it's a 30-day um, termination clause in there from the supermarket so it gave them a, an area to focus on understanding where the intangible value was and where they should maybe focus some of their resources in trying to to sort of better get a grasp of this this what is quite a broad area to, to sort of encompass and for those of you on the call today maybe you know internally to think about what is it that's driving your value which components are there for you for us within Oxpotica it's all about our people and our software and a lot of the data that we're collecting as well as other bits as well next slide please Richard um this picture some of you may have seen before, but I think it quite nicely structures the whole world of intangible assets into, into three distinct areas. And, and okay, we can argue the semantics around whether, whether, whether things belong in different boxes or other things to add. But the point being here is that in any organization, you've got a whole range of assets that relate to legal uh, IP, patents, trademarks, um, copyrights, trade secrets, and so on. Um, but then you've got a whole range of assets in the business which are all centered around your people. It's the skills, the knowledge, the processes, the software that they're creating. There's a huge amount of unrecorded and unrecognized invention and innovation that resides in companies as well, which adds significant um, value as well. And actually, particularly for companies like us, all of the or the majority of the value in companies like Oxpotica other small growing companies tends to reside within the people and the technology that those people are, are creating the stuff on the left there the patents trademarks that that's expensive that's a that's a that, that's a that's a rich boys game as i as i often refer to it you need to have money to start playing in that field and and it's and we'll come on to that in a moment but often what you find is for smaller companies the focus at the start is the stuff in the middle and then as they grow they start to sort of invest more and more resource time money into developing the legal side patents maybe trademarks and so on 
And then on the right hand side, it's all of the the assets that revolve around your brand, your reputation, your your route to market. And and I and I would probably argue for the big corporates, that's where the majority of their value sits within their their customers, their reputation, so on and so forth. And really what this comes down to is for any company, you can go on to the next slide, Richard. It's can you and how are you developing a balanced portfolio across all of the companies? Because fundamentally what the what the board, what the what your shareholders want to see is all of these assets in a way that is is managed and managed effectively and efficiently and is fit for purpose for the company. And what I've seen over the years of working with many companies is it's those companies that have got a good handle on this are the ones that are deemed to be more successful. Now, if we move on to the next slide, whilst this is all interesting stuff, and I, and I think for those of you on, on the call today, hopefully there's something of interest in what I've just shared with you. One of my frustrations with the IP world is there isn't that much publicly available data that you can start looking at to try and start to understand the IP behavior or IP strategies of companies. Um, and patents are one of the fewly available data points that are made public and, and companies like PatentSite have made fantastic software that pulls all that information together that you can start to harvest and, and go into the detail. But there's a lot of other areas of IP and tangible assets that we can't really see. But I wanted to share with you um, a little case study for a piece of work which we did oh, ages ago now, but kind of looks at a particular tech area and putting some patent data together with a little bit of business um, um, data uh, gives us a bit of an indication of the IP strategies that some companies have been have been exploring. So if we go to the next slide. Um, this here is a chart for um, a, a particular tech area, and it's looking at a raft of about 20 or so, 30 companies. And this data is taken from Crunchbase, and it's looking at the date when the companies were founded. So we've looked at a section of companies and we've looked to see when were they founded. And here we can see that there are some early players that were founded back in the mid 2000s. You then see a ramp up of companies sort of in the 2015, 2016, and then a couple more, more recently. And so I've just taken three of these companies at relative random to look at their patent filing, look at a bit of, a bit of basic investment data to see what their behavior around IP might be able to tell us. And I hope, it, I hope it's of interesting for some of you. So if we go to the first one, and this is a company that was, um, the data here, by the way, is, is, is take, extracted from the patent site stuff. It's very, just looking particularly at the, the, those of you more pseudo with the language, this is just priority dates on filings of families. So here we have company one, founded back in, in 2013. And then in around sort of mid, late 2015, they, they get their seed funding. And what we see is straight after the seed funding has been announced, we can then see that they started to file a few priority patent applications in the months following seed funding. Series A follows quite quickly. And then we can see they've gone up a notch and starting to file a couple more patents a bit more regularly to the point when it turns out this company was acquired back in late 2017. An interesting trend. What's quite fascinating for me is, is because this portfolio is relatively small, you can start to look at some other data around this. And, and I was quite fascinated by the people, the inventors named on the patents in this particular company. And so we had a look, um, a bit of data from LinkedIn and, and using the patent site data to see what have these guys gone and filed? Have they been named on inventions for any other companies since this they were acquired? Or have they been filing for their new company that owns them? And what's quite interesting is from the, I think there was about 15 or so inventors named on this portfolio, not one of them, not one of those inventors has been named on another patent filed for the company that acquired them or in other companies. And you can see where they've moved on from LinkedIn and so on. So this to me strikes me as a company that um, during their early days have kept things very quiet and confidential. They've strategically filed a few bits and pieces and kind of been window dressing them ready for an acquisition. And now they've been acquired. The inventors have disappeared into wherever they've gone now. Quite an interesting approach to IP. Whether I've got it right or not, don't know, but it's certainly for me quite interesting. So if we go to the next one here, same ecosystem, different company, formed around the same time. And you can see here, it's quite soon after their seed round funding was, was announced, um, a whole raft of priority filings got, Got, got registered 
And then they've presumably spent a bit of time on picking that before they've gone through Series A. And then we see this particular company is regularly filing quite a few priority filing applications every month or two. Um, quite an expensive portfolio. Um, they've gone through Series B now. I have no idea whether that trend has continued. Um, this analysis was done ages ago. But again, very interesting that here's a company that is investing very heavily in building up a portfolio of patented technology um, around its, its business. Compare that to the first company who have just been strategically doing a few, maybe. Um, let's have a look at the third one, because that, for me, is the most interesting of all of these. Um, another company founded around the same time, they go through seed round funding and nothing. They go through Series A and we see no activity. And then they're suddenly acquired. And we can see here, hindsight's a great thing, right? But um, as, as those of you know, patents aren't published for 18 months. At the time this company was acquired, if we'd have looked at the public records, we wouldn't have been able to see any patents registered to this company name. So lots of question marks about what, what, what are the acquirers bought, why, and lots of other questions. To me, this strikes me as a company that have kept a very solid confidential um, trade secrets, et cetera, et cetera, around their business and only decided to file some patent applications as soon as they started to engage with um, their potential acquirer. What's even more interesting from, from, from the data set here is one of the things I, uh, this is my plug for, for you, Will, and Patent Site, but Patent Site has these wonderful competitive indicators that kind of give you a notional view of how impactful patents are. You can look across this data to see whether any particular patents jump out as being more interesting than others. Across these three companies and the data set as a whole, it's one of the patents in this company three data set that is one of the highest rated from the Patent Site methodology. So to me, that strikes me as a company that have had a very interesting approach to how they've they've kept their IP under wraps around confidentiality and and um, when they've made that decision to 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 register their their patent applications. Let's just go to the the next slide and I'll, I'll sort of close out here and hand over to Robin in a second. But here's my kind of observations and takeaways and and, and hopefully a, a bit of food for thought for those of you on the call who, um, you know, from from a small company point of view, um, you know, investing in, in any sort of a, a patent portfolio, it's all about timing and it's about the cost as well. They're really critical. And, and I've worked with so many companies over the past that really grapple with this dilemma. At what point in your journey do you start to invest and how much? And a, and a recognition that often overlooked by many companies, confidentiality, keeping things secret, it's free, it doesn't cost you anything it costs you time and resources to get the policing right internally. And there is also the risk that other people might go ahead and patent some of your stuff. But it's one strategy that particularly company three there, I think, have adopted over the years. I won't read through the rest of the comments here. Um, you guys can read them at your leisure. But I think, I think for me, um, as a small company, it's a real challenge about when and how you start to dive into this area. But I think using some of the stuff that I've spoken about over the course of this little presentation, I hope gives a bit of an indication of the way that I've certainly experienced discussing this with 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 sort of senior stakeholders, boardroom and so on and so forth. And, and just one comment at the bottom of this slide, which I think is an interesting one, is whether and at what point you might consider acquiring patents from third parties as opposed to dipping into your R&D to file patent applications. And I say this because um, if I was at a conference last year and the heads of IP from, I think it was Uber, Lyft and Facebook were all talking about decisions that they'd made to go out and acquire patent portfolios from third parties in or around their IPOs or wherever to try and boost their IP position and buy them a position, which is why companies like IBM and at and and many others are very active in selling portfolios. So there's all, there is, you know, if you are engaging in filing a, your own patents and registering stuff, obviously it takes three, four, five years to get them through to granted with cost, et cetera, et cetera. There is an argument or a consideration to be had about whether it's worth looking elsewhere to acquire that if it's already exists in a shape that's suitable for your strategy. And I, and I guess to some extent that kind of links in a little bit to what Robin's going to talk about in a moment about looking at third party IP. But but I I hope that is of interest to some folks on the call and a few snippets of, of thoughts to take away or raise some questions later. Richard, over to you. 
Thank you, Alex. Um, uh, Alex, you have some interesting experience with small company, uh, large company, and uh, consultancy. Um, when do you think is the right time to invest in IP strategy? Investing in a strategy as early as possible in terms of investing in protecting that through patents and trademarks and so on and other bits that really cost you money. I, I think it just depends. I, I think I, I think it, it just depends. Each company is so different from the next one. And it depends on what your business strategy is and it depends on what your end game is going to be. And I think if I look at the three case studies that I've given, they've all had an end game in mind. And I think you can see there, particularly company two, aggressively sort of filing and building a port filing and building a portfolio company one to some extent company three not so much so i think each company is different and it's it's hard to give a definitive answer to that but i certainly think for me developing an ip strategy as early as possible is essential and and, and i guess on that note my thoughts around that are always when you're developing a strategy you need to understand yourself which is predominantly what have you got what, what are your key assets you know, we call it an audit in some parts of the industry. Do it yourself or get someone to audit your IP for you. But what's the market look like? Who are your competitors and what makes them unique and special? And and then you can start to put those two pieces together to see, well, what is it that makes you unique and special? And I think for me, back to that, that's the slide from Connor with all the little bubbles on it. To me, understanding which IP components are driving your value is really important for small companies because that's where you should be focusing your efforts and your resources in the early days.